Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now my guest this week is a doctor, a psychiatrist and writer. Anthony Daniels is perhaps better known to you by the name of Theodore Dalrymple. He's written for numerous publications over the years, most famously perhaps The Spectator, for which he wrote a 20-year column, and Standpoint magazine, and the Manhattan City Journal. His writing ranges everything from the arts and politics all the way through to his experiences as a prison doctor and psychiatrist. Amongst his numerous books, the highly acclaimed Life at the Bottom, Our Culture, What's Left of It, and Spoilt Rotten, The Toxic Cult of Sentimentality. Thank you very much for coming, Anthony. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. Theodore, me. Anthony, <laughs> Theodore. Either. <laughs> Either. Both. <laughs> Either. Um, you're, you're living in France a lot of the time now. Quite a lot of quite, the time, Quite yes. a lot of the time. I, I wanted to ask you what the view of Brexit is from France. I mean, when you look over from France, what are you looking at? What do you see? Well, it depends who you speak to. Yeah. So uh, if you speak to people who are uh, uh, antagonistic to the European Union, and there are quite a lot, uh, they think it's a great thing and uh, uh, they want it done as soon as possible uh, as an aid to breaking up the European Union. Uh, but there are, of course, many people who are in favour of it and think that uh, uh, this is just ridiculous and the arguments are absurd uh, and uh, it's a country becoming like the, uh, uh, the Third Republic, really. Yes. When you're in France and you're looking over Britain and the, and the coverage that you might see or not, what's your impression of, of how things have been over the past year, the past three years? Well, as I said, it's very much divided. Yeah. I mean, if you read Le Figaro, you, you, I read the newspapers. I don't watch television and I don't yeah. listen to the wireless, uh, yeah. neither in France nor in England. Oh, I see. Okay. So I read only the newspapers. And I, right. when in France, I read the French newspapers. Yeah. And in Le Figaro, you can find quite a lot of uh, uh, articles saying that Britain is doing the right thing by leaving. Really? Um, yeah. I mean, you s also read things saying the opposite. Le Monde and and uh, and uh, Liberation uh, are you read the opposite. So, uh, who take, if you like, the Remainers' yeah. si uh, view of things? So it's not. Uh, I don't know whether people in England now think that the opinion is just uniform in Europe. Right. That right. people just think it's a very bad idea and so on. They might think that, but a lot of people don't think that. Do you, I mean, you were a, a, a Brexiteer, are you? You voted in it? Or? I, I voted for Brexit, yes. Oh, you did, okay. When you look at, because you've written so much and so deeply about British culture, um, I know this is a huge question, but you know, what do you think, what do you see as being the main effects on British culture of Brexit? What do you think they will be? Well, I think Brexit is a necessary uh, change, but not a sufficient one. Right. So, of course, if our own uh, bureaucracy is the equal in stupidity and capacity to stifle uh, thought and innovation and effort and so on, uh, it's equal to Europe. Mm. Maybe it's even worse in some respects. So yeah. unless that these problems are addressed, I don't want to say that all our problems or even most of our problems arise from the uh, membership of the European Union. That is not so. So unless there are uh, certain reforms, um, or certain changes, mm. uh, then uh, Brexit will not necessarily be a big success. But at least it should allow us to control our, uh, our own uh, destiny. That destiny, if it's put in the hands of someone like Mr. Corbyn, will be a dreadful one. Yeah. And I'll be glad to go back to France and live there <laughs> full time. <laughs> but ha were you excited originally when, I mean, just notwithstanding what you just said, were you kind of excited when the vote was to, to leave? Did you, well, were I you surprised? Uh, I wasn't very surprised. Uh, uh, 
but I thought it was uh, one in the eye for our political class. Yes, yes. And, uh, and was one in the eye for Mr. Obama. I mean, if Mr. Obama and if Cameron had remained neutral uh, and Mr. Obama hadn't stuck his oar in, I think uh, the vote might have gone the other way because people have such a contempt and mistrust of our political class yes. that they will vote for anything, against anything that they recommend. Mm. Um, uh, but I wasn't very surprised. I wasn't terribly excited. I wasn't uh, as happy as Mrs. Miller was unhappy, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> I, I can't say I couldn't sleep that night for excitement or uh, feeling this, at like, you know, this is victory in uh, yeah. the Second World War or anything like that. I didn't feel elated. Right. I remember being elated, but anyway, I, I'd been involved in the whole, whole yes. campaign, but um, you've written an awful lot about British culture, often through the prism of your work uh, yes. as, a, as a psychiatrist and doctor, but one, one uh, particularly in the book, Our Culture, What's Left of It, one thing that comes out a lot is your concern about the coarsening of British culture. culture yes. Um, I mean, can you ex talk a little bit about that? Well, the coarsening, it seems to me, came from the top down rather than from the bottom up. So there was actually no real demand for the, this coarsening. When you talk about coarsening, what actually... Well, coarsening in language, coarsening in sensibility, coarsening in sense of humour. Now we can't have any sense of humour. It's yes. <laughs> almost... We can't make a joke for, for fear of... Them. And this seems to me a terrible uh, shame. It used to be that everyone, almost every class, spoke with a sense of irony. Yeah. And now irony, British irony, has, has disappeared. Also, the uh, the ability to uh, to put one's own sufferings in perspective that seems to have disappeared. And when I look back, I remember the figure of Mrs. Whitehouse. Right, this is Mary Whitehouse. Mary Whitehouse, yes. yes. And. Uh, of course, lots of people mocked her and so on and so forth. But actually, she was a very brave woman. And in essence, however ridiculous she might sometimes have been, she was right. Yes. That but if you allow public course, course public discourse, eventually it will filter down to the rest of society. Mm. And I think that's actually happened. The British are notably coarser than any other people in Europe, in really? my opinion. You mean when in I, their public life? You mean in public life? Everything. In their manners. Everything. When, when I come back from France, for example, I see it everywhere. Now, of course, I meet lots and lots, millions, well, not millions, but lots and lots, of very, very uh, nice, uh, decent, well-behaved, well-mannered, pleasant people, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, in the street, uh, in, in many streets, I, I've often wondered how far you can go before you hear someone say, oh, fuck. Mm -mm. And it isn't very far, I would say it's about, on average, probably about 10 yards or right. something like that. Right. And uh, there's a coarsening of sensibility as to, uh, as to uh, architecture, for example. Mm. Um, I suppose and that comes from the top down. That that comes mm. from the architects, architectural critics, and so on, who have made an incredible mess mm. of the country, mm. an incredible mess, mm. and they still won't admit that they've done it. Mm. This, uh, you know, there are these, I sort of typical British traits as were. Uh, yes. You talked about irony there, but there was understatement, sort of understatement, yes. um, self restraint. Yes. Um, it's almost as if we've undergone a gestalt switch. So those qualities which we used to think were good, we now think are bad. Mm. And, and not pouring out your emotions is a kind of treachery to the self. Yes. You mean it's sort of thwarting self-expression? Yes. And, and, you know, it's a bit like uh, an abscess with pus in it. And if it doesn't come out immediately yes. it will accumulate and come out in some terrible fashion. Yes. That, that's the idea. I believe it to be tot totally wrong, actually. But um, uh, uh, so now people talk about themselves all the time and all their pro petty problems and so on. Um, you wrote recently, I think it was for Standpoint, about the fashion for tattooing. Yes. Which is sort of 
part of this in a way, isn't it? Is it basically the fact that this is now almost universal, isn't it? Well, I think it's something like 30% of British adults are, are, are tattooed, or male, males. I don't, I don't know the exact thing, but anyway, it's a huge uh, increase and a, a very large percentage. I hope I'm not... Uh, Offending anyone here? No, 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 not at all. no, no. But the thing but, uh, but but I think that I mean the fact is uh, that it must mean something, and um, and I think I was fairly early in noticing the ascent in uh, in the social scale. Uh, so it used to be, for example, that virtually all British uh, prisoners were tattooed. The white ones, anyway, were tattooed. And there were sailors and a few others, but it's it's ascended the social scale astonishingly. But it's not just in Britain, actually. If we talk about France, uh, where now twenty five percent of people, uh, adults, uh, are tattooed, uh, there was an interesting statistic in Liberation about in the year two thousand, I think it was. There were four hundred tattooists in France, and now there are four thousand. It's, it's, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it, this particular thing, whatever you think. I don't actually have any tattoos myself, but I think probably quite unusual. I think, you know, it is, as you say, it's extremely common now, but it is about, it is about supposedly self-expression, isn't it? Yes. Isn't that what the... Well, it's a, a kind of individuation without individuality, and it's an attempt both to be a person and join a tribe, mm. because there is still something slightly antinomian about it. Mm. There's still this slight uh, flavour of being against uh, some kind of um, bourgeois standard, I suppose, yeah. about it. Yeah. But, uh, of course, you, if 33%, it's like being a bohemian now. No, it's impossible to be a bohemian. I would have loved to have been a bohemian. <laughs> <laughs> but it's impossible for two reasons. The first is... Uh, that I couldn't afford it uh, because <laughs> you know you can't go and hire one room in Belsize Park or something because it will cost you ten thousand pounds a week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing. But the second is everyone is a bohemian, and where everyone is a bohemian, no one is a bo bohemian. Yes, I, I suppose that to, be t to to be bohemian, there needs to be quite rigid kind of boundaries in yes, society, course, doesn't yes, there, that yes. you're transgressing. Yes, but and I remember this in the 1950s. I'm old enough to remember I had a cousin who was a bohemian and was regarded as a very loose and wicked woman because she, she wore an apple green um, a polo neck sweater and that kind of thing. <laughs> Wow. And that the best, if you look at the arch bohemian of the time, <laughs> slightly before my time, uh, Dylan Thomas, now he would be regarded as very old fashioned and, uh, yes, and, yes. and so on. I think um, the, the interesting thing about w w w tattooing as well is it's very in the present, isn't it? It's like, it's sort of, uh, of all fashions, uh, it's, it's, it's in the present. I. You know, you're not thinking, oh, once, you know, sooner or later, this is not going to look like this because yeah. my skin is going to change. I'm going to get older. My skin is going to droop. Yes. You know, it's almost like uh, we're living entirely in the present with, with, with tattoo. Yes, a permanent present. Yes. yes. And, and uh, however, what one also sees is the importance of adolescence in modern life. Right. Uh, so that it's not uncommon to see 70-year-olds dressing as adolescents. Right. So it's not eternal youth they want, it's eternal adolescence. It's as if, uh, you know, you reach a peak of life, at the, shall we say, at the age of 18 or 19, and that's it. There is no, there's no progression through life that, that makes you right. change. Right, right. Is that something particular to Britain, do you think, compared no. to Europe, no. or is it in Europe too? Well, I think it's, uh, all I can say really is I can, can only compare it to France, because it's the yeah, only country yeah, I know yeah. with, a, you know, a bit. Um, and it's very similar in France. In fact, I live in a, in a, 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 in a place which is, near a place which is full of soixante huit with men of my age trying to grow ponytails. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> do you think um, I mean, when you when you look at the state of British culture now, um, I mean, is it this thing? Do you think that we've heard many times that basically things change for the worse in the nineteen sixties, 
you know, that this was the great watershed time and that basically that's when things started to go down. This is, uh, this is a kind of trope that one hears a fair yeah, amount. Quite of often. I, um, well, uh, I, I, I don't think one can put a date and exact because these social yeah. processes go yes. over a long time. And, I, you know, I'm not going to be like Virginia Woolf and say that uh, human nature changed on the 17th of April 1910 or whatever, whichever yes. date yes. you yes. said. Yeah. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but I think there was a pretty big change in, in the 1960s. It, it was prepared in the 1950s. And uh, of course you can go, I mean, you could uh, plausibly go back to the Garden of Eden before, before yes. long. But uh, yes, I think there was a big difference. But one thing that, one thing that you have said or written uh, a, a lot about, which I think is very important, is you, you said you had come to realise that the intellectual life and the artistic life of a society was enormously important in terms of the effect it had. Uh, something that probably I would imagine in the mainstream th thought here people don't really think very much about. But but you, how can you explain that? In what ways is it hugely important? Well, I mean, in a practical if, if way. you take um, a Marxist epistemology, for example, they say that uh, being determines. Uh, uh, thought right. rather than thought determining being and of course it is perfectly true that most people think along lines that they grew up with uh, but ideas filter down uh, and um, changes in the kind of intellectual culture um, filter down. I'll give you one um, mm. co very concrete example from the prison. Um, a man came to me and said do you think I'm, uh, I steal cars, he'd stolen about 600, um, uh, because I'm addicted to stealing cars. Now the, the, the idea of course is that addiction is a brain disease which mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. can't control. Now interestingly that came not very long after I read in some academic journals a hypothesis that repeated crime, particularly car theft, but presumably other crimes, is a form of addiction. Mm. So this filters down to people who are, this kind of idea filters down to people who are at a very much lower level of education at, but are nevertheless capable of applying it uh, to what they think of as their own advantage. It isn't really to their own advantage but but, but it is. And we've all, for example, everyone has absorbed um, all kinds of psychotherapeutic ideas. People have absorbed the idea that, uh, that they've got neurochemicals which account for their various forms of behaviour. No one thinks of neurochemicals as, as accounting for their good behaviour, only their bad behaviour. Only their bad behaviour right. requires this kind of explanation. Right. So, uh, even quite recherche ideas filter down and and then affect behavior because once you once you accept I started thinking about this because of, I saw a lot of heroin addicts right and once you just say to a heroin addict you are ill there's nothing else you're just ill it's not unreasonable for them to say to the doctor well if I'm ill cure me then mm, yes yes um, and uh, I want you to cure me without my having to make any particular effort or sacrifice or anything on my own, of my own. And that's why these ideas are actually very important. They should not be, in my view, uh, bandied about uh, without opposition. So basically intellectuals, I think, as you said, have said, specifically le left-wing intellectuals, have had a, a bad influence on on society as a whole, or they've had a practical influence. Well, that's what I, I that's the burden of my uh, uh, my argument. Of course, people will come along and say, "Well, prove it beyond all reasonable doubt." I can't prove it beyond all reasonable doubt, um, but I think uh, that is uh, that is so. You were. Uh, a doctor and a psychiatrist this, in, yes, in, in, this is in Birmingham, wasn't yes, it? In for, a prison. For, for, for 20 years or so? 15. About 15, 15 years. years. I was on duty one night in 
uh, for ordinary medical duties, uh, uh, one in for 14 years, one night in three, and one weekend in three. So I actually spent more time, not as a prisoner, but more time in prison probably than many a, many a bank robber. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Given our sentencing, uh, our but, sentencing policy. But I, I remember that you've written because you've worked. I think it's four continents. You you you, yeah, you worked and lived in Africa for a long time. In, in and I think you you were making the point that actually the the general way people responded to poverty in Africa was entirely different to here. Uh, can you and, there, and it of course was a poverty of a very different kind. I mean, there there we're talking about poverty where people really don't know what, what they're going to eat tomorrow. Yes. Right. Um, and uh, and it was a very important experience for me because it it helped me to look at my own country uh, in a comparative light, as Dr. Johnson said, all judgment is comparative, and if you haven't anything to compare it with, then uh, you are likely to um, to mistake your judgments. I think. Um, so it was very important to me, and uh, let me give you a, a, another very small concrete example, something that I detest. I detest seeing people in torn jeans, right, okay. as if they are, as if it's some kind of solidarity uh, with poor people. Now poor people in Africa, if they can, uh, they make enormous efforts to look as good as they can, especially of course on mm. going to church or something like mm. that. And this idea that by dressing in false rags you are somehow expressing your solidarity or your sympathy for poor people just disgusts me. Right. So in other words you found more, uh, I think you're saying more decency, more dignity amongst people who had virtually nothing in Africa yes. than maybe you did in Britain? Yes. Yeah. I, I never saw, I, I'm, of course, my view is probably superficial and I was a very privileged person, but I never saw any, uh, the kind of degradation, the willful degradation, I should say, mm. in Africa that I, I mean, I, of course, I saw all kinds of corruption because once I traveled from, <clears throat> I traveled from uh, Zanzibar as far as Timbuktu, I chose those two destinations because I thought it would be a good title for a book. And uh, <laughs> I went by public transport. So I saw Africa from the bottom up. And it right. took me about six months and I saw the corruption and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, I did not see the kind of degradation that one can see in any uh, British town or city on a Friday night. Never. And that is why? Uh, ah, well, that's uh, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Is These this people, because of the views that have filtered down? Yes, or? I think so. So that actually people now, I mean, I ask, uh, I was once at a, a football match, uh, the Daily Mail, I was once their vulgarity uh, correspondent. Right. They used to send me anywhere where people were gathering and behaving badly, which was more or less anywhere they were behaving, uh, gathering. And uh, they once sent me uh, to a, a football match in Rome, a so-called friendly match. Well, of course, Rome hadn't seen anything like it since uh, the arrival of Alaric in 410. But anyway, um, uh, what I discovered was, of course, all these people were middle class. All mm -hmm. these people behaving badly were middle class. Mm -hmm. They were not uh, poor people because mm -hmm. you don't go to Rome uh, for a football match. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have no disposable income. Mm -hmm. And these people were shouting obscenities at the Italians for hours because we had to go in hours mm -hmm. before the match, the so-called friendly match. What it would have been if it had not been friendly, I, I don't know what it would have been like. But anyway, at half time, I said I was the only one not getting up and swearing at the Italians and saying, yeah, and, uh, well, I won't repeat what they were saying. And I said, excuse me, um, could you just tell me uh, why you've come all this way uh, to shout obscenities at the Italians? And he said, um, well, you've got to let your hair down. Mm. He was a computer programmer. And uh, <coughs> I said, uh, I said, well, why do you have to? Mm -hmm. 
uh, to which of course he had no answer. But actually what this what these people seem to have absorbed is that to behave badly is to be truthful to oneself right. and, and therefore ultimately good. Right. -y. You've uh, you, you're an atheist, do you not? You, you, yes. you, you're not a religious man. Uh, but at the same time, talking about society and the foundations of society, uh, if you accept, you know, that ours is a Judeo-Christian foundation yes. to our society, um, presumably you think those values are good values. But at the same time, you don't you, you don't believe you don't share them. Well, That's I don't share the, the I don't share the uh, the theological underpinnings of right. them. Right. Right. Uh, but I'm not an, I'm not anti-religious, right? And uh, you know, one of the things I did, for example, in the area uh, in which I practiced in Birmingham was go to a Pentecostal church, and I went possibly in a spirit of sneering, right? Because all these people get up and speak in tongues, and yes. it all seems slightly ridiculous to me. But I came away with a great deal of respect uh, for those people because they were people who were trying to find meaning in life. Many of the people got up and, and, and said how they'd found God because their sister had been, just been shot dead or something for some trifling right. reason and so on and so forth. And these were people in search of a meaning in life and a structure in life. And what was very interesting is that it was the one place where black and white people could meet together completely mm. um, without any problems. Mm, mm. And they were all extremely nice people. Mm. And uh, so uh, uh, now you might say, well, they were nice people and therefore they, they, went, they were religious, or they were religious and therefore they were nice people. Right. But clearly there was some kind of connection with their goodness and their beliefs. And in those circumstances, I wouldn't go and try and argue with them, saying, "Don't, don't be so ridiculous," you know. The, yeah, don't, yeah. Uh, don't uh, speak in tongues or do anything like that. I was just very glad for them that they found meaning in life and that they behaved well. And they, they were very nice people. And also, it's there is something about it's good to be, be, to believe in something. I mean, yes. you know, outside of yourself. Self, yes. This is the point. What is the, what is the alternative to be completely self-absorbed? Well, I mean, there's... Uh, you can have a, a, a purpose. I think one of the reasons that there have... We are so, now so um, uh, um, aggressive in our politics, why people of opposing political views can't be in the same room together, and why they, um, they're so shrill is that actually they're replacing religion by, uh, mm. reli uh, by political purpose. Mm. So a transcendent political, uh, po uh, religious view of life has been replaced. Uh, we do need transcendence unless, of course, we just have to struggle for survival. Yes. I mean, yeah. if I'm concerned about having to work in order to get enough to eat tomorrow, I, I, I'm not going to worry about these things, but but uh, if I have some kind of leisure, uh, I have to fill it with, and preferably with a purpose. Uh, so I think one of the reasons we have so many religious sects, uh, sorry, uh, political sects now, and they are like sects, um, is a loss of religious belief. Although I can't say myself that I have any religious belief. There is this view, isn't there, that when people stop believing in God... God don't believe anything, yes. Yes, they don't believe nothing, nothing they believe anything. Anything, yes. Well, it does seem a yeah. bit like that. Yes. I mean, that does seem to be uh, the case. You uh, actually started writing... I remember reading your columns in The Spectator, yes. you know, religiously. Sorry, religiously. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, you actually started uh, writing relatively late, didn't you? And well, I started late. in uh, nine. I started when I was thirty-three. Right. And I was working in the Gilbert Islands in the Pacific, and I sent sites uh, uh, just on spec. I sent an article to uh, to the Spectator, and in those days, uh, Charles Moore was a deputy editor, and he had the unfortunate uh, job of reading through unsolicited articles, and uh, I. I started. Now I don't think anyone 
I don't think anyone would do. So that. you were taken on, sort of, as it were, on spec. I mean, a piece that yeah. you wrote that never happens. That's, that's almost. Uh, I think that Charles Moore said that he that you he, you were one of the only writers that he had, where he took an article on spec, as it were. Yes, but I think he had to go. <laughs> I think in those days they had someone who actually went through them. I doubt whether they have anyone like that now. And I think that I think our, that there has been a narrowing anyway of interest in 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 our publications. Yes, no, definitely. Um, you d have written a huge number of books. You have some. You you've written one what came out a couple of months ago. Yes. In praise of folly. Yes. And that was an account of my journey from Shropshire to South West Wales through the uh, books that I bought en route, because it's actually a very good route uh, for second-hand books, which is a kind of passion of mine. And the object of the book was to show that if you go with the right attitude, you can easily get enough to furnish your mind for the rest of your life in a day or two. Oh, I see. Okay. You also said actually that in fact you get something or we can get something from almost any Me? book. Yes. Isn't that right? So uh, whether it's Jackie Collins, yes. Hollywood Wives, whatever it is, right up to, you know, uh, Dostoevsky, anything Isn't will give you something. Yes. Uh, yes. I so how do you, you, do you actually practice that? Do you read? Uh, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't select <laughs> Jackie Collins, but if I were to read it, I'm sure I would get something out of it. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that you get an equal amount out of every publication, mm. uh, but actually I was once stuck in, um, I don't know how it happened, but in an airport hotel in Los Angeles. And for some reason, the one thing I've learned in life is never to go anywhere without a book. And mm. for some reason, I didn't have a book with me. So I started reading the telephone directory, the Yellow Pages, and they were very, very interesting and uh, slightly alarming because I, first I looked up bookshops in Los Angeles and about this size, you know, and shops like that. Then I looked up private detectives and there were at least 50 pages of private <laughs> detectives. Well, that must... Yes, <laughs> tells you something. It tells yeah. you something, yes. You can take something from almost any cultural artefact in a way, can't you? I mean, I, it's not to say that one, you're saying that they're all the same and they're all of equal value, but you can take something, something from yes, something. Yes, yes, that's yeah. what I would say. And uh, I suppose, uh, I mean, I, I suppose I uh, shouldn't quote Pasteur, but he said that uh, uh, f uh, fortune favours the mind prepared. That's why education should not be relevant to a, child, to a child's life, but to teach him to expand yeah. what is relevant to him. Yes. Well, it's a wonderful way to end, actually. Um, and she, thank you very, very much for coming. Mm. And uh, your, the book I mentioned is called In Praise Folly, isn't yes. it? Um, and that can be got on Amazon and yes, uh, it indeed. can indeed. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's it for this week. So thanks very much for watching. And, uh, do subscribe, won't you, and see you next time. Thank you.